I want to introduce our first panel, and I couldn't ask for a better person to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, I've watched Jenna Blaha first at Marie Claire, and now as the um, technology fashion editor at Elle. We've worked super closely together. As a matter of fact, she did a preview of women's wearables at the show before any other magazine got there. Um, she keeps her eye on trends from a fashion and workplace perspective, and she will introduce the rest of the panelists who we're delighted to have. Enjoy your day, and I will see you all later. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Oh, there we go. Good morning, 9 a.m. You must really love wearables. Thank you so much for being here so early. Like I said, you must really love wearables or you just didn't go out last night and it was a big party <laughs> night. So appreciate you being here. Um, as Robin said, I've been covering this topic for a long time at the magazine and I feel like this is the year where we're finally past the honeymoon phase. It can, we can really actually talk about the state of affairs as it exists. There's not as much speculation. I think we have a better handle on the future as it really stands and not as we thought four years ago it was going to be. So with that, I just want to introduce my panelists. We have Angela Pan, who is the CEO and founder of Ashley Chloe. It's a startup company that focuses primarily on wearables for women. We have Sylvia Heisel, who is a fashion designer as well as wearable expert. And we have Greg McKelvey, who has a lot of titles and does a lot of things, but is the executive vice president and is really leading up the wearable cause at Fossil Group. So I think the best way to start is just to hand it over, talk about your brand yourself, and we'll look at some of your products. Greg? Sounds good. We flip the slide. Uh, if you don't know who Fossil Group is, we, we've been around over 30 years, and we're best known for, over the last 30 years, having created the fashion watch market um, across the world. We do uh, about $3 billion in revenue, 50 million units of fashion accessories a year, uh, with 30 million of those being watches. Um, within our portfolio of brands, we design, develop, manufacture, distribute globally watches for many of the best fashion brands in the world, from Michael Kors and Kate Spade to Tory Burch and Puerto Armani, and then many of our own brands, Fossil, Skaga, and Michelle, uh, and others. Um, over the last 30 years, um, truly a global business um, and, and very successful. About four years ago, Though we looked at what technology was going to do to and evaluated how technology is changing how consumers shop, what they expect out of product, um, and we've we went on a on a path to reinvent literally every part of our business to integrate technology into how we design product, into how we reach our customers, how we market to our consumers, um, and went all the way as far as um, acquiring a technology company to integrate better technology into our design and manufacturing process for specifically wearables. Um, we have uh, three global regions, 16 fashion brands, we're in 150 countries, and we have 14,000 uh, employees. We often get the question, you know, can a fashion company be a technology company? Are those two things at polar, polar opposites, or is there a convergence that can be led by a company? And, and that's fundamentally what we believe and, and, frankly, what we've done and spent the last few years doing. When you have capabilities at the breadth of design we do and in branding, what we've been on the journey to do is two things, very simply, add features and functions that people care about into traditional watches. So on the left-hand side, you have something we call um, hybrid smart watches. Uh, it does notifications, sleep tracking, fitness, uh, tells you your commute time when you go home, th things of that nature, but it's got a year's battery life, and it looks like a traditional watch. It's waterproof, has all those other same elements. And then we've entered smart watches with partnership with, with Google, deep partnership. And our role in that category is not to beat Apple, it's to win our fashion customers with the same functionality that Google can offer, but with better fashion design. So with the technology enablement now inside the company, we're, we did over the last 24 months since the acquisition of, of the Misfit company, over 300 SKUs of wearables across 14 brands, 50 countries, 20 languages. We'll do probably six to 700 million in retail sales this year in wearables, and it should be something north of 20% of our business all within the last 24 months. Don't know how familiar you are with these brands, but in general, you, you, you should be able to say there's an, this is an unmatched portfolio of fashion brands that we're now bringing to market. We think that our watches in the not too distant future, driven by the fitness and health and wellness trends, 
driven by what we believe the personal assistant that, you know, the Alexa battles, the Google Assistant battles that's coming to your wrist very quickly as well. That technology is now small enough to be integrated into our devices with, across the best brands in the world with diversity that, that only Fossil Group can, can offer. So that's our role in what we do. Look forward to sharing more with you. Great, thank you. Sylvia? Um, okay, uh, I think I just have the one slide. Um, it's going, no? Just press it? Yep, there we go. okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, hey all, I'm Sylvia Heisel, and I come to wearables and technology from fashion. I was a designer for many years with my own label, doing traditional fashion, women's evening wear primarily. And about 10 years ago, I started getting first really into sustainability and how could the fashion industry become more sustainable, and then from that into technology and how could we incorporate technology into making apparel and into smart apparel. Um, and since then, I've kind of been on a journey from leaving fashion, working in design for wearables, doing a lot of consulting, uh, and then somewhat back into fashion and now working on prototyping of things and working on um, you know, how can fashion brands, helping fashion brands incorporate technology into their products, both on the design side and incorporating it into the garments and on the supply chain side and new manufacturing. Uh, so this is a prototype piece. That is a fully print, 3D printed vest, which incorporates solar, flexible solar panels and heating. Um, and it is very, very much a prototype. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that excites me. And what I think we're going to see in the future is pieces of clothing that really incorporate, that aren't tech products or fashion products. It's really beautiful design. Um, Angela. Oh. So um, I'm the founder of CEO of a company called Ashley Chloe. We are based in San Francisco. Um, the company has been around three years old. So we established in 2014. Uh, our goal is to design and produce, um, create an audio, wireless audio technology product for a female market. Um, when I started this company, because I saw there's a big gap in the market that there's no any other brand or company they have specialized design uh, technology or consumer electronic product for female market. However, as a female consumer myself, I was always looking for something tech, consumer electronic products or tech product that can fit with my style. Um, so that's how, the, that's how the brand was born three years ago. Uh, with Ashley Chloe, we are first launched on Kickstarter. We have uh, raised P order 270,000K. Launched the first product with the two, uh, the Bluetooth headphones that you can wear on the waist, which is some uh, the first product we launched that we are wearing right now. And later on, we continue expand the product portfolio to two wireless Bluetooth earbuds. And the reason we purchased announced a month, a month ago, currently our brand, uh, the two wireless Bluetooth earbuds, has been ranked uh, ranked number five, top five uh, in the market uh, among Apple, Samsung, and Java. Uh, with under the same parent company, Ashley Crow Inc., we have two different brands. Ashley Crow is focused on female market. We have another brand which is our introduced later on, which is focused on the active adventure lifestyle. We just announced this product in, uh, at a CES. We also have the booth at the second floor at Sands Expo to showcase our latest product. Um, the Fuse is the airbag charging. Uh, it's two wireless airbags that you can actually has the fast, uh, fast uh, charging capability that five minutes can charge for two hours play time. It comes with Qi charging and also type C. Uh, as you can see, it's very beautiful des design with aluminum materials. Um, we have partnered up with a jewelry designer who based in Brazil. Um, she is an amazing woman to support a woman in one of the villages in Brazil who doesn't have a job. So she teach them how to make jewelry collections. So each of our jewelry are handmade and also our, basically the cost of the, the label, the label which will actually donate, donate to contribute to this, uh, the woman who in this village, village who doesn't have a job, so to support their living. So this um, wearing this jewelry pattern is actually special designed for 
the fields, so the Airbus can put into the uh, the pendant itself. So for female, when you don't have the pocket with you, like when right right now, so you can actually put the Airbus into the pendant when you don't have the charging cases. And also, but if you want a charging case, charge your Airbus. The charging case can charge for <coughs> up to 15 times. So the charging case have 40 hours battery life that you can actually charge the Airbus. Great. Um, so another brand, um, Roken, um, because as the company, when the company just started, we are creating a brand uh, that target female market. But later on, uh, we created another brand which is called Roken because I have been doing uh, basically startup. I'm very entrepreneur spirit. I've been, um, is, I consider myself as it's an adventure uh, uh, a personality. So I created this brand especially designed for uh, people who are going outdoor, uh, active and adventure lifestyle, so that they can use this product for their daily use. So for Roken product, we also launched this uh, accent, um, which is, uh, has a feature of type C and uh, a C charging, white charging capability, and also compatible with uh, Google Assistant Alexa's. It's water resistant. Uh, as you, can, you can see the materials that we use, the weight. Um, basically, you can easily carry, like for male market, that you can actually carry everywhere with the protection and also performance. Great, thank you so much. I have to say I'm really appreciative of Ashley Chloe because it gave me one of the first examples of wearable tech for women. When I was begging my magazine to allow me to start covering technology, there just wasn't a lot. So, um, And now we're here. So we discussed a little bit about how we started our wearable brands, but I think that talking about the evolution of wearables and how we even got started is really helpful to figuring out where we are today. So Greg, as you said, 2014. Yep. Fossil Group, known for accessories, not so much for technology. How did you get them to agree to really prioritize this and put yeah. a strategy in place around this? Um, you know, m many people don't know, um, Fossil had been doing wearables since the early 2000s. Actually won before CES, it was, uh, it was called Comdex, and we actually won one of the Comdex products of the year in 2002 for a p one of the first Palm Pilot watches. Wow. Uh, we had a first Bluetooth watch with Sony Ericsson, we did the Microsoft Spot watch, and, and they all had a few major limitations. Um, one was just the functionality just wasn't quite there. There weren't use cases that changed your life in any material way. Battery life wasn't there, um, and they were just too big. The, the technology was too large. You couldn't get it into a beautiful device that people actually want to wear. Um, so 2014, you know, there were rumors of Apple coming out with a watch, probably at our price point. We said, you know, we, let's, let's go after this. Um, let's look at, at the market size. And several ideas came together that, that converged to bring us into it. First, um, you know, the, the watch market globally is about $60 billion. The market we under $1,000 we play in is about $30 billion uh, in revenue. Most of the projections uh, that we saw and then that came to life were that the wearables market should be, on, on for the wrist, roughly equal to the size of the watch market we play in. So there was clearly a market opportunity there. Technology was small, uh, getting much smaller, so we did some prototyping and then you know, as you can see from many of the devices here, the Kate Spade watch we just launched, uh, Scoggin watch, and then some of the hybrid smart watches, you're now getting technology into form factors across beautiful designs and brands that frankly people want to wear. And the cost were, was coming down. And so we figured out if we could get the right functionality, we can get in a beautiful product and get it to price points that are accessible to our customers, the market can be ours, and now it's just a matter of executing well. And right. that's the path we've been on. And you're on a five-year path. You were talking about the CEO being a visionary. Yeah, we, we're our founder, our, our CEO, chairman, CEO um, Costa, who, who doesn't uh, doesn't do press, doesn't like to talk about himself. Um, you know, he and his brother founded the company over 30 years ago, and and he is always f thinking five to ten years out. He's a merchant and a data-driven innovator, but at the same time, he's a, he's a visionary, and so. Once, once we came to the conclusion of the market opportunity and our capabilities for branding and design matter, then you just can't imagine the internal support to, to go after it. Um, and that's why we've been able to build a, such a big business so quickly. I think it, we can all agree that wearable market is a long-term plan. It's not something that you can come out with as a marketing opportunity. We see that those brands sort of fall to the wayside and everybody else still here. Um, I think 2014 was a really magic year. That's when Ashley Chloe was also founded. How have you seen the market really develop, especially starting with women and focusing in that space? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of for uh, wearable market for female, um, I think from the female market perspective, because we are really focusing on look great, 
fashionable style. But at the same time, how technology can integrate to the product can, can, is compatible, uh, especially like I think when we actually first um, designed the first product, the heater scout where you went, the, the Airbus that where you wear on the waist, we face a lot of challenge that how you can make the product in a smaller sizing, but also with the technology in it and also with the battery life, because I think we all expect to have a longer battery life, but however, how you can actually make that everything integrate together with a smaller sizing. So that it's, um, and um, like to make sure the product looks great. So that was the challenge that we are facing. And I think for female market, uh, uh, from the fashion side, um, we are looking for a product to look great. Um, we may not, be too much pay attention on the technology. The most important is easy to use. If I pick up this product, I can just like turn it on, turn it off, I can easily use at the same time, make me look great. Um, I think that is the trend that in the, the past few years, I think as we as a company, and I think as a lot of company out there who are in wearable space, everybody is trying to look into like how we can make this product kind of technology compatible into the wearable form factor. Well, it's interesting when we were discussing prior to the panel the difficulties of even figuring out where to sell mm -hmm. and that sort of difference between the, the men's approach to wearables and the women's approach to wearables. What are some of the big opportunities and obstacles for each of those markets? Yes, yeah, so for us, um, since we have two different brands, so um, we realized that for female market, a lot of female, um, like for Roken, we launched in the Best Buy. Uh, however, for female market consumer, they're looking for, they don't go to Best Buy, they don't go to tech, they don't go to gadget store to look for a consumer electronic product. So the way that the channel we're trying to distribute is for, uh, I think for product, tech, tech product for male market, we distribute out like distributing channel, uh, like a Best Buy store and tech store, Boeing store. But for Ashley Corey product, we pretty much focus on the e-commerce, which is like we run through influencer program. It's really rock by mouth because I think female market is shot differently compared to male. Um, that's the way that we're trying to differentiate. Sylvia, I'm curious on your perspective on this because not only are you making products for men and women, you're making accessories ready to wear, you're consulting with a lot of fashion brands, so you have a great overall perspective. What's been happening in the last few years? <laughs> okay, I think, you know, from a fashion point of view, you know, we did the first pieces that we did with a lot of technology in them of clothing, which were, you know, some stuff with lights in it and fashion pieces and this was like four years ago or so, and they, got, they actually got called in by a lot of magazines, and then we'd get this feedback going, oh, the model won't put it on because she's afraid she'll get electrocuted. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and there was this fear from the consumer of, oh, what am I gonna, you know, I'm gonna put this thing on, and am I gonna blow up or what? Mm -hmm. And we've eliminated that pretty much. You know, I think that's, the consumer is ready, um, you know, and then, although we, you know, we talked about this, of, that the, you know, for us on our pieces, we, you know, I started in women's and I really, women's is, is where my DNA is on designing. And then when we started to do technology things and started to incorporate that, uh, and we went out with, you know, with my brand really as an R&D kind of lab and it's a little tiny thing we took it to trade shows and the response was kind of horrible from from the women's brands and really strong from the streetwear brands mm -hmm. and that was you know that was where we found a market first was that the you know that younger male audience that's a sneakerhead and that's a they were like, okay, new technology, bring it on. I want more. Let me know what it can do. Tell me about it. And they were really engaged. Um, I think that's shifting now. You know, I think that's no longer the case, but that was the early adopter. And now we're seeing women go, okay, I want information. I want clothes that function. What does it do? Give me information. And there's a really strong interest from the women's fashion world. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. I'll never forget. I think it was an Alexander Wang jacket. When you're saying models being afraid of being electrocuted, right. it was a jacket that would just change colors right. with heat. 
and we got it into the fashion closet and we have everybody in the office standing around being like, can we put a blow dryer on this? Is it going <laughs> yeah. to explode? But I think you touched on the two big different markets, right? Just besides men and women, it's sort of the, the hype followers, the sneaker right. heads, the people that just want something because it's new and it gives you sort of value right. um, in that sort of cool space. And then the, the people that are slow to move on it but need education. And that education really is the brand's responsibility. And I think that that is where we're heading now, is trying to figure out how do brands educate. Greg, what does Fossil Group do to really onboard consumers? Yeah, you know, we spend a, a, an incredible amount of time thinking about this problem, um, particularly with the way we've approached our categories. You know, Apple and, and Samsung and, and others have really marketed the smartwatch. And so, our, our consumer awareness and marketing activity, mostly through influencers and a lot of uh, online and social activity, is about, you know, hey, we're in this space too. Here's a beautiful product, beautiful, beautiful design from the best fashion brands in the world. By the way, backed by Google and Qualcomm and the best technology companies in the world. So we've, we've been doing that. And with, with our hybrid smartwatches, um, it's a different challenge because the category doesn't exist. We're integrating technology and features people care about into a product that looks like a traditional watch. Uh, and so th in that instance, it's been a lot of, of, of point of educating our sales associates, also influencer marketing as well, but educating sales associates. And in this instance, anybody that goes to buy a traditional watch, it's have you thought about a hybrid smartwatch? What's that? Uh, here's all the features that it does, and by the way, it's only 30 to $40 more than your traditional watch. Yes. Oh, by the way, you don't have to charge it every night and the screen doesn't go black. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different customer and a different education process, um, and it's a category we're creating, but we think it will be equally or, or maybe potentially even larger than the full smartwatch business. That's great. Angela, are you seeing like a similar learning curve and sort of the necessity to bring the female market up to speed with what the possibilities are with your products? Yes, so they, um, when you're actually building technology into a fashionable product, there's always a challenge we, we have been gone through um, because like in usually consumer, they don't see, they don't understand what there is in, the, in this product, what technology they have. So we have to read really building the message across the board um, through basically emotion touch, you know, use different campaign to really try to educate the customer, deliver the message, what feature there is. Um, because a lot of time when people, first time when actually when we launched the first product, people look at our product. Is this a tracking? Is this a tracker? Finish another fitness tracker? But we, we tell them, no, this is actually airbox, airbox in the cuff. So they say, wow, that's amazing. So that's basically, it's like, you need to really like educate, keep educating um, your, your consumer through different program, influencer, marketing campaign, video, just keep educating them. Um, but as a brand, there is, it, it is a challenge when you actually design a product that have integration with all the features into one. Yeah. Right, I think that the consumer today is really aware of all the tracking opportunities, mm. but they don't know what to do with that as well. It's just a lot of information right. that you, you see and I think people fall off around three months because they're like, great. Mm -hmm. I know I don't walk enough. I already knew that, right? Um, Sylvia, working with so many brands, I'm curious to hear how the fashion and tech worlds are working together to try and not only make products, but also relay that to the consumer as well. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, there is a great opportunity to tell stories now yeah. in fashion and in, you know, fashion that the brands that are being successful in fashion now and that are, that are thriving are telling a story. They're finding a tribe. They're explaining their products. They're integrating, you know, they are bringing function into fashion and, and they're telling their story of what their product is, how it does, what it does, why, you know, there's the sustainability thing is really important. I think the stuff that resonates with consumers right now is the transparency, sustainability, customization is coming in a big, big way. Um, and all of this can take advantage of technology. You just, you, you know, it, technology has an, has an opportunity to make clothes that are better and to make, you know, and wearables already that are better than, you know, 
better than an old watch. Well, and I think we're seeing a market shift, right? Where it used to be these tech brands begging fashion designers right. to give them use cases, right? Like right. we have this tech, but nowhere to put it. Now I think that fashion brands are finding that they really need the tech companies. So are you seeing yes. this? Yeah, that's definitely the trend. Okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, fashion brands are seeing that, okay, I can use technology to make my clothing, to make my brand better, to make my all of my the stuff that I make better, whether it's on the back end or on the front end, um, mm -hmm. but it, it makes a better product. That's great, Greg. You know this better than anybody else. No, I was just going to say, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we 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 uh, one of the aha moments um, was our CEO stood up in front of the leadership team one day and he said, look, in 10 years, I think everyone's going to look back at the traditional watch and said, well, how dumb was that? All it did was tell time. Right. And, and it's not, doesn't take a lot to add a few more sensors or, you know, whatever the, the technology now is into, it's getting so small and much less power hungry that it's just going to do more. And it might even just be a microphone to, to be your personal assistant that's always on you. Right. It might be as right. simple as that, um, but it's, it's happening, and, and that's the world we believe in, and we think everything we make will be connected in five, ten years. Well, you have so many different licensing brands, too, and I think that that helps as well with sort of educating the consumer, because you can use the familiarity of these brands like Michael Kors and Marc Jacobs. How do those brands find you, and how do you work with them? Yeah, you know, our core competence has always been understanding those brands, understanding how to design for the best fashion brands in the world in the way that's unique to them. So with the Kate Spade watch we just launched, it's understanding that brand and then building design elements like uh, the polished scallop on the top ring or the iconic spade on the crown. It's, it's understanding those nuances and then how to bring products to market in a way that treats the brand well. And so we've done that for 30 years. Right. So now they're faced with the challenge of technology and product and we're, they, they, they understand if they're working with the technology company, those technology companies don't get those nuances. We do. Right. And now we have the engineering capability to, to really lead this convergence of fashion technology in a way that no other company we believe in the world can do. Well, Angela, I know that also working with local designers is very important to you, and you touched on it a, a bit at the top of the conversation. How is the local designer approach to partnerships really affecting the business as well? Yes, so um, as a company, when we start a company, we position us as a fashion tech company because um, we don't want to position ourselves just a technology company because we are we really trying to merge between both space, fashion and tech space. So, um, however, I think that fundamentally we understanding from a fashion perspective because a lot of the different infrastructure, the design mindset from fashion company is very different from a tech company. So we wanted to have the DNA in a company that we are actually merging with two space. Um, but with the technology that we are developing in-house at Together, uh, we are also leveraging other local designer. <laughs> Uh, basically, one of the designers they work with the jewelry, jewelry pattern. Um, sorry, so um, it's a jewelry, amazing jewelry designer. We trying to partner with and leverage their um, their talent, and also moving to for next step is we also plan to partner with some local designer who are based in the local in the Bay Area and also United States. A lot of small business owner like the designer, they have an amazing talent that they develop amazing product with the accessory and jewelry. So we really trying to help them to also grow their business together as us together um, so that we can partner together to create more accessory, uh, expand a product portfolio company together with a tech product that we create uh, to expand a product line. That's great. Well, I know that we're winding down. I want to make sure I ask Sylvia, though, about sustainability, because that is definitely a topic for us at the magazine and something that I think... Tech... Yeah, I think, it, you know, I think it has to be part of the conversation at this point because it is so important to the consumer. Uh, you know, if the car companies are all talking about sustainability, mm -hmm. then, you know, the wearables certainly should be. Uh, and a lot of it is about telling the story. It's not about, okay, you know, we're going to make all these things all of a sudden sustainable, it's about let's be transparent, let's, let's tell the consumer what is good, what's not good, let's, you know, make it, bring that conversation into the room and mm -hmm. make it part of it and be transparent because it's not, you know, it's not a perfect, it's not a, oh, we're going to make things sustainable, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to move in that direction. Right. Thank you so much. I want to leave some time for some questions. All right. Hi, my name is Ben Peck. 
Um, so technology and uh, the, the pieces that you're implementing in your products um, inherently is something that, that customers want all the time. So uh, a fitness tracker or earbuds uh, you want to have with you all the time, but fashion is something that you want to change from day to day. So uh, I guess with like a watch, um, you want to wear a different watch depending on your outfit, but you always want to have that fitness tracker with you. So do I need to buy, you know, seven days of the week, uh, seven different watches, and how do I keep all that data synchronized? Yeah, good, great question. Uh, we think about this a lot. Our, our, you know, prior to doing all of these products, um, our core fashion customer, ha especially female, over 70% of our female, our, our watch sales are to females. That customer has five to 10 watches. It is a, it, they have a portfolio, they change it with their outfit or their occasion, right? Um, and so that's what we've been trying to replicate that. So with, with uh, hybrid smart watches, it's, it's one module today. We have a couple modules and we produce new products to, to match the seasons and the marketing stories to five fashion seasons a year. Unlike any technology company out there, that's how we operate and how these guys operate, I'm sure, as well. Um, we have branded apps. So for each of those hybrid smart watches, there's one branded app for Michael Coors or for Fossil or for Kate Spade, designed by them, enabled by us, all that, that house all the data, regardless of what watch you wear for that brand. So you can, you can have five watches of Kate Spade, all the data and all the preferences and settings are set once, and you can rotate your, your watches. And so you, don't, you have no compromise of, the, of that fashion experience that you've, you've had with your traditional watch. We have one more back here. Hi, uh, the question is in general to, to the full, all the panel here. Um, we are seeing wearable tech becoming an, literally an essential part of the fashion world now, slowly and slowly, and it's a very encouraging sign. Uh, do you guys see payments also converging into it? Do you see payments being integrated into wearable tech, uh, like the, the likes of Apple Watch and Apple Pay and Samsung Pay? Uh, do you think it'll make, it makes life much easier for, for people going forward? Um, I, I I'll take that. Yeah. You know, I think of it as the internet of people. It's about all of these technologies. It's not, you know, it's not, okay, it's this technology. It's not a tracker or a alert or so. It's about the convergence of clothes that we wear with technology that helps us and makes our lives better. And, and I'd add there's three, three broader technology trends that we're building into every product we make. Um, your personal assistant, so Google Now, Alexa, health and wellness, and not just performance and fitness, but health and wellness, stress level, things of that nature, and convenience, which is, is payments with a couple different uh, types of technologies to enable that. All th three of those will be in nearly every product we make in the near future. You know, so it's the add-on, basically. I think we, as a company, as a brand, we really need to think about what technology the consumer really want, because I think we have a lot of different technology here, you know, finish check, check your steps, heart tracking, um, basically a payment system. There's a lot of different features we can integrate into the wearable product. But however, at the same time, I think we also need to think about what is, whether we can make an affordable price point. Because price point at the end of the day is very important to the consumer. We can integrate all the technology into one piece of the product, but however, whether it can make it affordable. So that is another topic that we should think about as a company. So we should really focus on what the consumer really want and pick one or two different focus to actually to integrate those products to make it affordable for a consumer. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you, Jetta. Sure. Thank you.